بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف النبي المرسلين محمد بن عبد الله وعلى صحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, No doubt all people uh, seek success and the utmost success is entering into Jannah by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the utmost loss is getting to hellfire والعياذ بالله and the only way to get to Jannah is via one person is who is Muhammad Sallallahu the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu because he's the messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and he is the medium by which by whom Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala revealed uh, Quran and also uh, we learned Sunnah from the Prophet and that's why it's very important crucial for us to study learn and talk about the biography of the Prophet ﷺ. In those sessions, we'll talk about some aspect of the Prophet ﷺ biography. We'll rely mainly on Al-Rahiq Al-Makhtoum, the sealed niktar by Sheikh Mustafa Al-Mubarak Fouri, uh, Sheikh uh, Safi Rahman Al-Mubarak Fouri, uh, Ta'ala. He passed away almost 10 years ago. And this book is really concise wonderful uh, summary of the Prophet Sallam's biography. Uh, the story of this book, particularly uh, almost 40, 41 years ago, the Muslim World League, Rabbi Ta'ala al-Islami, launched a worldwide competition in the biography of the Prophet Sallam. And many uh, people uh, submitted their uh, proposals. And this book, Al-Rahiq al-Makhtoum, the Seal Niktar, was the prize winner for that competition. It ranked number one, and the Muslim World League uh, recommended printing this book, and since then it's been on the shelves, and um, it's been translated to English and other languages, as up to my knowledge. Uh, in this book, Sheikh Safi Rahman Barak Fouri talked, uh, before he talked about the Prophet Sallam's story and his uh, childhood and so on, he talked a little bit, which made sense, about the Arabs, history and position and status around the around the birth of Prophet Sallam and even before that. Lots of the history about the Arab before the Prophet Sallam centuries ago, uh, lots of details that mean we may not have to go into it. But maybe just talk about the the Arabs history just right before the birth of Prophet Sallam. In terms of the religious status of the Arabs Arabs used to be on the deen of Ibrahim alayhi salam, a tawheed, monotheism. Until one of the high esteemed people in Quraysh called Amr ibn Luhay al Khuza'i, he's got status in, in, in his uh, nation and people, went one time to Asham, Syria and Jordan area and so on, and he saw them worshipping idols. So, because Asham, as we know, is a place of prophethood, so he thought that this is a right, a right thing to do. So he brought with him Hubal, one of the idols called Hubal. He brought him to Mecca. He put him in Kaaba, and then, since then, people started to worship idols. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in Hadith uh, that he saw. Abu ibn al-Hayy in the hellfire dragging his intestine because he's the first one who brought this shirk to Mecca which is obviously uh, a very important lesson to all of us we all of us have we all of us have our own shortcomings and our evil things we do but never share it with anyone else never tell someone let's do this and that things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like. Because if you do it yourself, you repent, Allah will accept your tawbah. But if someone else did it because of your guidance to that evil thing, then obviously uh, you will get sayyat and uh, sins from what that person is doing. In terms of the uh, economic status, Arabs used to live on or survive on trade. But unfortunately, because 
lots of robbery and lots of stealing was going on there. So the only times of the year that they were able to go and trade safely were the Al-Ashhur Al-Hurum, the sacred months. Shawwal, dhul qaida dhul hijjah and Rajab. And those the months where Arabs used to have their huge markets or festivals like Mijanna, Ukal and so on. In terms of the ethics of Arabs, they used to have qualities make them distinguishable from other nations and very unique to them. Uh, both bad qualities and good qualities. So in terms of the bad qualities, um, in terms of the social, social hierarchy of the Arabs, women used to have no status. She doesn't get inheritance. She gets ignored. After her husband died, any one of his children could, or any one of his the husband's relative could marry her. She has no opinion on that, and so on. Also, one of the things that used to be in Arabs as well, the types of marriage. In Bukhari, Aisha radiallahu mentioned four types of marriage used to be going on there back then. One of the types is the one that we use as Muslims. A person goes to a man who is responsible for a woman, propose the marriage, pay dowry, and get married to that woman. Another marriage was nikah al istibda. So a, a husband will ask his wife after her period is done to go and sleep with someone who is smart or intelligent or of status hoping that a boy will come out of that conception who has the same features and characters of that person that his wife slept with so she would sleep with that person and then when she goes back to her husband her husband will not have any intercourse with her until she gets pregnant, then he knows that this boy is from that man. That's obviously the Prophet ﷺ nullified this marriage. The, th the third type of marriage, a number of less than 10 men get to a woman and all of them will have, will sleep with her. And then when she gets pregnant and deliver the baby, she would ask all of them to come to her tent. No one could abstain. No one could say no. All will come. And she would say, you know what you've done. And I've got this baby. And it's your son. And she will point at one of them. And that person cannot say no. It'll be his son. That marriage is also nullified. And the fourth type of marriage is basically prostitution. So some woman would have would have a flag on their uh, place, indicate that they, they prostitute, and lots of men enter and they, all of them sleep with her. And then when she gets a baby, she would call those men, and then Al-Qafa. Al-Qafa, people specialized or have the, the skill of matching a baby or a boy to the father based on the way he look or the, the fingerprints of uh, prints of, of his feet and so on. So uh, that person will say it's so and so son and he cannot deny that. All of those marriages are nullified except one marriage which is the marriage that we have uh, right now as Muslims. In terms of the ethics of Arabs, what some of the strong ethics that they have. One of them is they were well known of hospitality, generosity. They were so generous and most of their poetry was around generosity. A man could have only one camel or one she camel, naqa. That's the only survival for himself and his family. And could have a guest coming to him in a cold weather. And this is the only survival 
thing for them, for the family. Yet, out of generosity, he will slaughter this she-camel to feed the guest. They even used to love khamr, alcohol. Not because it's alcohol, but because it takes out their minds so they will even become more generous because there is no, no mind to think about money. So they become even more generous. And that's why they used to call, they used to call, so generosity in, in Arabic called karam, and they used to call the grape tree al-karam. So they called it, they derived that word from generosity applied to the grape tree just to indicate that how it's helpful to allow them to become generous. One also, one of their features, which was somehow the reason for Hamza ibn Talib to embrace Islam, as we'll know later, is Izzatun Nafs, the self-esteem, the intolerance to any sense of injustice or humiliation. Once an Arabian feels that he is being humiliated, all what you see is blood. That's a reaction. That's a response. And here I'm reminded of a story uh, back in Jahiliya before Islam. Uh, there was a, a person of status in his uh, people called Amr ibn Hind. Uh, sorry, Amr ibn Kalthum. And there was another person who was a king, has similar name, Amr ibn, ibn Hind. So one day the mother of that king was talking to the woman sitting with her and she said, I am the most honorable woman in Arabs. So one of the ladies sitting with her, she said, no, Layla, the mother of Amr ibn Kulthum. Don't you know that her husband is, and she, I think the husband was a king or so, and her uncle was of opposition, and her son is a chief of his uh, people. So this woman, the mother of this king, she said, I will make her serve me. In other words, you'll see who is the honorable. So one day she asked her son, who is the king, Amr ibn, uh, Amr ibn Hind, to invite Amr ibn Kulthum and his mother for a visit. And they came for a visit, so the men sat together, the women sat together. Then the mother of that king asked her, her host, her guest, sorry, bring me that pot from the table. So the guest woman refused and she said, The woman who needs something, she shall go carry it herself. So the, the host insisted on her because she wanted to want her to serve, right? To, to prove that she is the most honorable, right? She, so she insisted on her to bring that pot. So the, the woman, the guest, she shouted, Wadullah, which means I'm being humiliated. Her son, on the other side, when he heard that, immediately, Jump to his sword and kill the guy. Do not play with those people. Any sense of humiliation, all what you see is blood. So immediately he jumped to the, because he, he heard his mom shouting, Wadullah, she's being humiliated. So obviously he felt, my, hum, my mom is humiliated, you will see the result. And he killed the guy, the guy is innocent, he didn't do anything. <laughs> but he just killed him and then his people, the, the people of the guests, conquered the palace and they stole everything and, and so on. And then he uh, had very famous uh, Arabic uh, poem start with the um, and very long uh, poem. Po 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 so those, those features used to be in Arabs and probably that was one of the reasons why out of the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he selected Arabs because they have that, those kind of characters that will allow them to carry on the message of the, um, of the Prophet Sallallahu So Prophet Sallallahu in terms of lineage, he is Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, Ibn Abdul Muttalib, Ibn Hashim, Ibn Abd Manaf, Ibn Qusay, Ibn Kilab, Ibn Murrah, Ibn Ka'b, Ibn Lu'ay, Ibn Ghalib, Ibn Fahir, Ibn Malik, Ibn Nadr, all the way to Adnan. Let's talk about Hashim, the, uh, the grandfather of uh, 
the grandfather of Abdullah, the father of the Prophet ﷺ. Hashim, his actual name is Amr. His actual name is Amr. But they called him Hashim because Hashim in, in Arabic means the crumbler. The one who crumbles things. Because he used to crumble bread to feed pilgrims. And he was the first person who created and invented the two trips for Quraysh. Rahlatul Shita'i was Saif. The summer trip and the winter trip. He's the one who invented that trip. Then, this Hashim went one day to, uh, for, for, for one of the trips. And on his way back from uh, that trip, he went to Medina and got married to a woman. And that woman, then he died. He left, like he got married to that woman and then he went on his, on his trip. Then he died. So that child, when he was born, he had a white hair. Like the hair that all people has, have. Uh, and that's why his, his mom called him Shaiba. Shaiba in Arabic means gray hair. When someone has gray hair, out of old age, they called him Shaiba. So he stayed with his mother until he became almost like eight, ten years or so. Now his family, now this guy we're talking about, Shaiba, is Abdul Muttalib, is the grandfather of the Prophet ﷺ. We'll talk about why they, he was called Abdul Muttalib. Now his brothers back in Mecca, he's got Al Muttalib and other brothers, they didn't know about him when he was born, obviously. But then they heard about him. So Al Muttalib. The uncle of Abdullah, the father of Rasulullah, his uncle Al-Muttalib, went to Medina to see his younger brother, whom he just learned about. So when he saw him, his eyes welled up with tears, because he saw his brother, his younger brother, and he kind of hugged him and put him on his camel going back to Mecca. So the child, Al-Muttalib, this Shayba, refused to go with him until his mom agrees to do so, agrees for him to go. So when he asked his mom, mom refused. So Al-Muttalib told his mom, he's going to the kinghood of his father in Mecca, the kinghood of Hashim. The, Hashim is the grandfather of the Prophet's father, right? Muhammad bin Abdullah bin Al-Muttalib bin Hashim. So she agreed. Now on his way, Everyone knows Al Muttalib because he is the successor of Hashim. So he's one of the, uh, he's the leader of Quraysh. But no one knows who's this boy. So when he, they saw him, they, they thought that this is a slave of Al, Al Muttalib. So that's why, that's why they called him Abdul Muttalib, the slave of Al Muttalib. And even when they said, oh, Abdul Muttalib, <laughs> he said, hang on, this is my brother. This is the son of Hashim, our father. This is not. My slave. But anyways, people called him Abdul Muttalib and that, that, that name uh, went on. Later, Al Muttalib went for a trip to Yemen and he died. So his younger brother, Abdul Muttalib, the grandfather of Sallam, led Quraysh, was the leader of Quraysh. When, when he became, when, when, when Al Muttalib died and Abdul Muttalib became the leader, Nawfal, the uncle of Al-Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ grandfather, robbed him some, 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 some properties in Quraysh, robbed Abdul Muttalib those, they, they are for Al-Muttalib, so they should go to Abdul Muttalib, but that, no, that person, Nawfal, robbed those things from him. So Abdul Muttalib, the, the Prophet ﷺ grandfather, asked Quraysh to help him. Quraysh said, well, we cannot intervene between, intervene between you and your uncle. Sorry, we cannot do that. So he sent, Abdul Muttalib, he sent a message to his maternal uncles, his mother's brothers and family in Medina. Help me. This guy, my uncle, robbed my inheritance. So his mom's brother, uh, his name is um, Abu Sa'd. He marched to Mecca with 80 horsemen ready to fight to get his nephew's uh, heritage. 
So when he arrived in Mecca, a place called Al Abtah, Abdul Muttalib told him, told him, "Come to my house." You know, to, well, he wanted to to, to 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 serve him and host him and so on. So his uncle said, "No, until I meet Nawfal, the one who took those things from you." And he went all the way to Mecca to to, to Kaaba, and Nawfal and other uh, big people in Quraysh were sitting there in the shade of Kaaba, and he took off his sword and said <laughs> by the lord of the house if you do not return to my nephew the things that you took from him i will make this safe uh, the sword in you like i will kill you basically so <laughs> nofal said you know what i returned to him and all ashiach quraish the, the oldest the elders of quraish said uh, they witnessed that then he stayed with Al-Muttalib, uh, stayed at Abdul Muttalib's uh, side, uh, place for, for three days. And then when he went uh, back to Medina, uh, okay, so uh, that's 20 minutes. Uh, shall we stop for here and we'll continue tomorrow? Okay, we'll stop here for now and inshallah ta'ala will uh, continue. Um, uh, tomorrow inshallah ta'ala after maghrib prayer wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh